it must be so hard to watch that happen from the outside but what is it like more from their perspective like how do they describe what it feels like to them the delusions the voices it must be like really terrifying for them could you share with those experiences with law enforcement have been like for all of you and what you think is wrong about how our system responds to mental illness it's like every episode always violent or is like they're more calm episodes and more like violent episodes wow these are such thought-provoking questions and they come from journalists who are in high school members of the youth cast media group this project trains high school students from under-resourced communities to be effective solutions-based journalists. And in this episode, they turn the tables on the three moms and ask us the hard questions about mental health and serious mental illness. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. All right. Happy almost holidays. This is our final episode of 2023, episode 81. We are well into season four, and tonight we're so excited because we're turning the tables. As young journalists, high school journalists, are going to ask Mindy and Mimi and Randy about mental health and serious mental illness. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Hi, guys, by the way. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Mimi. Hello, nice hello, hello. We're not going to do too much of a talk back because we're going to be answering questions tonight. But I'm so excited. I know, Mindy, your daughter is a journalist. And I'm just so excited to see young people work so hard and get so interested in stories. This is the YouthCast Media Group. They were formerly the Urban Health Media Project. And what they do is they train high school students from under-resourced communities, and they report, and they write, and they broadcast stories about health and social issues that affect their own neighborhoods and their cities. And the goal of YouthCast Media Group is to help students understand and communicate about health issues that affect them. And they also want to foster a generation of diverse journalists that will enter and enrich news organizations across the country. I first heard about them from a, a voiceover and radio colleague. We've been saying we're living parallel lives, Marianne O'Hare. And Marianne was, even though she didn't found this, she is a producer and an instructor. The founder, Jane O'Donnell, is on a plane, so she couldn't join us, but give you a little more, more information. Jane O'Donnell, as a journalist, won numerous awards in her nearly 30 years as an investigative reporter, including the story on how early airbags were harming small children. Right, Marianne? Yes, and uh, I was uh, speaking with Mindy earlier in our conversations that uh, her daughter, who was also uh, was on that beat, um, she discovered through her investigative uh, journalism uh, skills that uh, babies and children, particularly, even when properly buckled, were dying um, by, by airbags. And her work led to a change in the national standards for airbag um, design. And uh, so wow. that was a big, a big moment for her among many. And there and you know, she just has a passion for journalism that is unparalleled. And um, I met her through the Health Journalism Association when I was producing a national healthcare show, Conversations on Healthcare, and I was with some really great veteran journalists. I was a producer, a radio producer, but I met these amazing, talented journalists, so passionate about covering healthcare because the inequities in healthcare, as you all have come up against the realities of that throughout your experiences, are absolutely criminal. And and it's so there's a passion among those journalists. And uh, so she she moved into that territory. And um, that's what really sparked her interest when she saw the industry changing, that she wanted to take this knowledge she had and do something really meaningful with it. And she started this in, I think, 2017, um, focusing on kids in neighborhoods and people from underserved communities who are most impacted by social determinants of health. So she's a force to be reckoned with. Many of our instructors have written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Cleveland Plain Dealer. So it's a terrific organization that she has founded. And um, 
Uh, we really hope to do great things. And our students that come in, these young students, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, yeah. are learning these topics and learning about them as they're learning to write about them. So it's really exciting. That is so exciting. And I'm so glad to, well, let's bring them on. We've learned a little bit. Let's just actually meet the reporters and their First is Karma Owen, who is a freshman at Herndon High School. Herndon is in Virginia. She's recently joined YMG and just starting on her journalism journey. So Karma, you can turn on your, your camera. There she is. Hi, Karma. We have Hello. Safa Jenjua, who is a sophomore. Oh, same high school, Herndon High School, recently joined. And she is also very busy producing social media posts on topics around mental health and distracted driving. And she isn't sure what her college major will be yet, but I maybe the dream would be in photography. But you're certainly getting great experience. So welcome, Safa. And finally, Kayla Johnson, a senior at Crystal Ray High School in Philadelphia, and she likes to do anything that helps her to showcase her creativity, like reading and writing and cooking and doing art, and is producing content for the YouthCast media groups. She also is interested in distracted driving and decriminalization of mental illness, which is a favorite topic here at Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. So reporters, I'm not going to call you ladies, I will say journalists, reporters, I'm going to hand control over to you. You have formulated a list of questions. And we also have producer Maddie on the sidelines with her camera off in case anything goes awry. And I'm just, okay. you know, here we are when you want, I guess you've decided who's going to ask the question and we're just going to answer them. So who's first? First of all, thank you all for having us. We're very excited and happy to be here. Um, and excited to ask you the questions. Mental illness is so un so common and still misunderstood. And serious mental health is illnesses like schizophrenia is especially hard. You all have signs with schizophrenia. Could you help us understand what diagnosis really means and why it's devastating? Oh, big question. Who wants to try that first? Well, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, to me, it's devastating because the person changes so much. And in the case of our son, quite rapidly, he had been using drugs and running around with um, a drug using crowd in high school. And he had changed gradually in that regard. But when he finally became psychotic, um, it just happened so it seemed suddenly he was away at college and he was seemed fine when he left. And then when he came back, we actually, I walked right past him at the train station. I didn't recognize him, how he looked even, how he smelled because he wasn't grooming. And also, but more scarily, just how he acted. He was volatile, had a hair trigger temper, um, and he still was using drugs and he just, didn't seem like my son. He felt like he was somebody else. But then even worse, he thought I was somebody else. He thought I was an imposter, not his real mom. He felt like he was in a horror movie and, you know, like the body snatchers had taken over me. So he had to get rid of me and kill me so he could get his real mom back. So that was it. That was, I can't even begin to say how that made me feel, but um, but we were devastated as a family and he was terrified. And we were uneducated on mental illness, even though my grandmother had had schizophrenia. She did not present like he did. You know, that's the aspect of it um, that to me made, made it all the more excruciating was that it was so foreign you know, it was something we just didn't know anything about. I mean, in some families, there's, you know, it, it runs in the family. Or, but I mean, even like Minnie said, she even had it. And it, it still, it is out of left field. And it is like a gale force hurricane that blows through your life. And anything that's not nailed down is just gone. So you wake up one morning and the terrain of your life 
is altered forever. And there's a learning curve of acceptance with that because you go for a long time thinking somehow I'm going to get this back to normal and I'm going to fix this. And you lose a lot of um, valuable time with that folly of a thought. And then the other thing, the, the, the devastation of it, the, the, the nucleus of the devastation of it is ambiguous loss, is you've lost your child. And yet he's standing there in front of you, beautiful and handsome and healthy physically as he ever was, and not your son anymore. And I don't think that the human psyche, certainly not this mother's psyche, was prepared for or equipped to process all of that. And I I can echo those emotions. So I will address a little bit your question about, you know, what the diagnosis looks like, what it really means. And the closest I can explain it to someone who's never seen a loved one with serious mental illness is I hope in your high schools, you haven't seen friends on a drug trip or seriously drunk and making no sense at all and having delusions, or perhaps somebody who is deliriously ill with 104 fever. If you've ever seen someone you love in a state like that, that is what it it can look like they they're making sense to themselves but they're not making sense to us they have delusions as as Mindy was saying that just aren't real i so that schizophrenia itself is not about split personality it is about splitting the mind splitting from reality to fantasy and so whatever's going on in their minds that they're not aware of, they're living in this other world where whatever they're thinking is real to them. And it comes and it goes and it grows and it subsides a little bit, but it doesn't really go away. They don't get cured. They can be stabilized with medication, but that's why the, you know, the illness is so devastating because suddenly this person you have raised and you figure the Every all the ethics you've put into them is going to stick more or less. Everything seems to fall apart, so it affects their personality. Does that answer your question? That did. Hey, who's next? Um, it's Safa. But my question was that uh, you all write about the transformations you've witnessed before your eyes, your seemingly well-adjusted kids start to spiral downward. And it must be it must be so hard to watch what ha watch that happen from the outside. But what was it like more what's it like more from their perspective? Like how do they describe what it feels like to them, the delusions, the voices? It must be like really terrifying for them. Yeah, you know, one thing that I, I was just uh, the other night rereading something from my own book that I was looking for something. And it, it's a part about where years later I found journals that my son Nick had kept during those years. And um, with, you know, it's been 20 years. So with the perspective of time and uh knowledge now i i can put pieces together that I, you know if i'd read them 20 years ago i wouldn't know it's almost like deciphering a foreign language but i read them and i realized oh my god you know if i'd read them then they wouldn't make any sense now they make a lot of sense and the message in there and all the scribbling and all the repetitive words and everything was he was all alone he was all alone in this horrible churning sea of mental illness that engulfed his brain, not knowing how or why, just only knowing that he was failing. He was letting everybody down. He was letting his parents down. His friends wouldn't talk to him anymore. Nobody understood him. And um, it's chilling. It's chilling to imagine what that is like for anybody, but especially your own child who you are responsible for in every respect. And you realize they were in another world, in another reality, all alone. Wow. 
I, you know, as you, as you reporters may know from your research, one of the saddest things about schizophrenia is that they don't know there are many of them are not aware that they're ill because they're so engulfed in their inner world. That is their reality. And so my son has never explained to me what it's quote like to hear voices because he says he doesn't hear them. And yet I see when he is not uh, stabilized with his medications, I see him you know, gesticulating in the air and, and, you know, talking as if he's having a conversation on the telephone, but there's no telephone. I think these days with cell phones, they look a little less crazy because we all walk around with, you know, earbuds in and talking, but it's kind of like that. But I do remember Ben came down with his illness very gradually, as many do, and it's a, it's a prodromal stage. And he would go in and out of reality. And I remember one time he was starting to lose his friends. He was starting to fail at school. He was starting to get withdrawn. And I remember him going into his room and looking in his box of keepsakes. And just a year before when he had so many friends, he had friends that had signed his wall. He had so many signatures. The phone rang all the time. And all of that was going away because he was acting weird and people were just dropping him. And he started to look at some of the birthday cards that friends had written him. And suddenly it's like the clouds cleared. And he said, mom, I, I just have to go for a walk. I don't understand what's happening. I used to be so happy and now I'm not. And I want to take a walk and figure it out. And of course he couldn't figure it out. He, he took a walk, but you know, that was a moment when my heart broke for him because I don't think he understood what was happening. I too, like Mimi, can look at things that he wrote and poetry that he wrote, some of which is in my book, and and see how very confused he was and comforted by his own delusions, I think. Anything to add, you, Mindy? You, you have such good questions, you young reporters, that um, that we're, of course, all going to want to answer most of them because they're <laughs> such deep questions. So, Jim... Um, was never a writer. So I could not any time find anything he had written. I haven't got that. But I think more so than Randy and Mimi's sons, uh, my son and I always kept in communication and he did a lot of talking about how he felt. And some to begin with, we had arguments, you know, because I I just wanted him to shape up and he thought I was the devil or something like that. And so we were just kind of arguing and I thought it was the drugs and I wanted, I flushed his drugs down the garbage disposal and we argued about those kind of things, but we always talked. And once I realized that he had, or the doctors told me that he had uh, schizophrenia, first they said it was depression and he was on an antipsychotic. Then they said it was bipolar. Then they said it was schizophrenia. Now it's schizoaffective. And we all went down that path. People don't realize that's just the diagnosing procedure. But all that time, once we got done arguing and I got done being afraid of my son, because that part about feeling he had to kill me, that part went away when he started on um, even the antipsychotics that don't currently work for him. So we had deep discussions and he, he, he did feel all alone, but he kept his friends for quite a while, but he always thought they didn't like him. He's always thought nobody likes him. And actually he's a very, very likable person. Everybody really does like him. His providers now, his friends, people like him. But the reason he thought no one liked him is because he kept hearing voices and he did talk to me about the voices a lot and he didn't want to admit they were voices. So he's kind of like Randy's Ben. He said, I don't hear voices. And he just would shriek that at me. But then he would go ahead and ask me why I had just told him something when I hadn't said a word. So he was hearing my voice in his head. And he then admitted that he had intrusive thoughts. So he would, he he knew, I think, that it wasn't cool to have voices. So he didn't want to. So he called them intrusive thoughts. So I'll just, okay. Well, I'll say that Jim and I have always had a really lot of conversation about what, what is going on in his head, how he's feeling. 
And that's, um, I used a lot of that when I wrote my book, because he was able to tell me what was inside of his head. I kept a journal about what he said. So when I wrote, wrote the chapters, I could actually go and see what we had talked about. So I feel in talking with lots of other families like Mimi and Randy, very privileged to, to have privy to what's going on in Jim's head. And we continue that to this day. He's doing so much better, but nothing's ever perfect. And so I always get immediate information and feedback with what's going on. So that's a, a blessing. All right. Thank you. And if you, you know, if you're listening for the first time, because you're fans of our reporters, uh, Mindy's book is Fix What You Can, Schizophrenia and a Lawmaker's Fight for Her Son, Mimi's is He Came In With It, A Portrait of Motherhood and Madness, and mine is Ben Behind His, mine is ben Behind His Voices, One Family's Journey from the Chaos of Schizophrenia to Hope. So... The commercial is over. Just wanted you to know what the <laughs> books are that we're talking about. Uh, Kayla, I think you're up with a question. Yeah, you are so open about your son's experiences and that very often the first experience with the psychotic episode involves run-ins with the police. At YMG, we're really interested in how America has criminalized mental illness. That is, Police are often called to handle a mental health medical crisis. You all talk about this topic a lot. Could you share what those experiences with law enforcement have been like for all of you? And what you think is wrong about how our system responds to mental illness? How do we decriminalize it? Well, you are speaking my song. That is one of my high horses. That one and supportive housing and the lack of supportive housing. I guess we have lots of high horses, but the first way we really entered the mental health system was because we were told to call the police. We were working with our son. He was working with a psychologist. He called me to report that Jim had uh, had thoughts of killing me. So that's how, why he had to talk to me. So I asked him what we should do. We met with him. He couldn't do anything because Jim wouldn't accept help. So we were told, call the police. That was our first entry. And that was 20 some years ago. So I think it's a little better. There's lots of places that now have embedded social workers and crisis teams, but still the police are called all too often. If there's any sign of dangerousness or the person isn't voluntary, then the police are still on the forefront. And then people get killed, people with mental illnesses are right up there with people of color in being killed by the police, 20 times more apt to be killed by the police for people of color and people with mental health crises. So it's a national disgrace. Yeah, I'll echo that with a short anecdotal story. Um, and this is when I was well into it. I mean, 10, 12 years into all of this. So by then, I knew a thing or two about a thing or two, but you still know that you have to utilize the police. I mean, you have to, because unfortunately there aren't that many choices. And, um, and so you learn how to talk to them, how to call for help, what to specify, what to say. But for example, 10 years or so ago, uh, my son got his hands on some edible THC and went into psychosis. And he happened to be at the office of the um, healthcare people who sent his, uh, you know, his daycare worker who comes. And so she called me and she said, Mimi, something's really wrong with Nick. And I said, please don't do anything till I get there. Cause that's what I'm terrified always of is the police and that he's going to end up dead. And so I jumped in my car and I drove 40 minutes to where he was. And as soon as we got there, I could see he was psychotic. And so we called 911 and I explained all the information to them, said everything the way I was supposed to say it. And a couple minutes later, the first person who shows up is the big small town cop and his partner in their car. And they come zooming up with the siren, which we had also asked not to do because it's very agitating for Nick. And 
gets out and, you know, meanders up and there's Nick over there talking to himself, acting crazy. And I went up to the cop to try and explain to him what was happening. And he just looked at me. I got two or three sentences out and he says, you know what? I don't need to hear all this. You tell that to the EMTs. I, you know, that's not my area of expertise. And I looked him in the face and I said, well, you know what? You're the guy with the gun. So I'm going to tell it to you. And when I'm done telling it to you, I'm going to stand between you and my son until the EMTs get here, which is what I did, which, you know, makes me sound like the big hero. But if you consider the fact that I'm a middle-aged white woman, I could do that. You know, I know they're not going to shoot me. You know, it gives me a certain privilege, a certain footing to stand on. And even at that, it was scary. And that's the position that we're forced in. And when I think of people who don't have the um, information and education to know how to deal with them, not to mention, God forbid, you're not a white woman, that's how people end up getting killed. And it's disgusting. There, there's a lot to uh, unpack here, so I'll just keep my comment short. I currently do have a son who was incarcerated, not in prison. He's in jail, free trial for something he is accused of that we don't even know if he did. And I will say nobody gets jailed because it's a crime to be mentally ill. That's not what they say. Oh, you're going to jail because you have schizophrenia. They get put in jail because nobody knows what to do with them if they are loitering or, you know, they can just be doing very nonviolent things, disturbing the peace, or they could possibly be doing something potentially dangerous, but they go to jail first before they're sent for help because there's no room for help. So it, then no one's saying it's a crime to have a mental illness. It's just the system doesn't know what else to do with them. I believe my son, his appearance at the time of the arrest was certainly a factor in being judged by the police. Overall, I have had very good experiences because most of the police force in my town are crisis intervention trained. And my son was never, I was never scared in the way that, that Mimi was, but I there we do have a couple of episodes about the the um, prison system and mental illness that answers a lot of these questions. Changes must be made. A huge percentage of people in jail are mentally ill, not because they're they're charged with the crime of being sick, but because their illness causes certain actions and nobody knows what to do with them. So they put them yeah. in prison. I would like to add briefly, um, the city of Minneapolis, we've always had trouble here in Minnesota with our the Minneapolis Police Department. They uh, have been under a spotlight since George Floyd was murdered there. And now the Minneapolis police are under a consent decree by the National Department of Justice. So they're looking with a fine tooth comb at how people of color, BIPOC people are treated and right up there, as I said before, they're also looking at mental health crises because both are huge problems. So you asked, you hit the hot button as far as I'm concerned uh -huh. with that question, Kayla. Are you guys satisfied with the answers? Did you get the answer to the question that you wanted? I have one more question. Okay. It's like every episode always violent or is like they're more calm episodes and more like violent episodes? It's a good question. For Jim, it those wasn't violent, on the list, which I appreciate. Though for Jim, those violent episodes were only at the beginning and then salted throughout the years if he was high on drugs, any drugs, even uh, marijuana. But he was using crack a lot um, for several years. And so when he was doing that and his meds wouldn't work then, antipsychotics don't work very well when you're using illicit drugs, especially things like marijuana can really do a job on people with schizophrenia. I don't think a lot of people know that it can even cause psychosis. And there's research to show it can actually lead to schizophrenia. Now there's nascent research in that department. So 
those are the violent times. But most of the episodes, I would say 90% of them are Jim going in his room and crying. And for my son, you know, he's, uh, he's never had a violent episode. He's sometimes looked at me like he hates me and tells me I'm not really his mother and called me crazy. But he has also stayed up all night thinking God was talking to him through a bush and giving him the secret of the universe. He has wandered the streets trying to cheer people up. He has a fantasy that he's going to start cause world peace with the right poetry. So there are many episodes of psychosis that are just confusion and kind of ravings and sometimes very artistic, but not very understandable. My son writes reams of poetry when he's psychotic, but can't understand it the next day. At least I can't. So, you know, also, I would say one of the most tragic aspects of it, of this is that the answer is, Absolutely not. It doesn't always involve violence. Most of the time, I think it doesn't. Certainly with my son. I mean, the only violence that he ever um, displayed was like smashing fists through walls and things like that, but never any threat to anybody else. And I used to go to the police or call for help. And this is what I would hear is, well, call us back when he's a threat to himself or others. So then you get caught into that catch-22, that horrible rabbit hole where you have to wait for your child to be violent or hurt somebody or hurt themselves to get help. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that with another disease, with cancer? Oh, well, um, come back when they're stage four and we'll treat them then. We don't, we don't waste our time with stage one and two. That's basically how this is approached and so we are counseled i've been counseled to even orchestrate violence in order to get help how sick is that all right thank you for that question thank we'll you time check okay we have we have a good 15 20 minutes left so who is next i am um... Okay. Sometimes during psychotic episodes, when they're having delusions, your sons have threatened violence against you or themselves or others. Have you learned to handle that phase or of the illness? It must be so frightening. How do you protect yourselves as well as them? So we have begun to answer this a little bit, I think. Um there are a lot of tips that families can follow. And one of them is to speak calmly and breathe and give them a chance to calm down. You also learn to go to their level. If they're sitting, then you should sit. Uh, I teach a course called Family to Family for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we, in a crisis file, we do teach some of these things you you want to stay as loving as possible and also agree with them as much as possible if they say uh, i i'm i'm so scared because i i think the space aliens are coming after me you will rile them up when you say oh that can't be true you're acting crazy that doesn't help what does help is wow that must be so scary i be on their runway, love them as much as you can. If they're brandishing a weapon, that's a different thing. But even even in people who are neurotypical, if if they're complaining, they have a customer complaint because they bought a blouse and it was ripped, the worst thing a customer service rep can say to them is, well, don't be mad. That couldn't have happened. It must be your fault. Like, you know, if, if we blame our sons, they're going to get more riled. But if we go, oh, my, oh, that's so sad. I'm so, you must be, you must feel so scared. Try to agree with them as much as possible. And also, um, in addition to getting on their level, I was learned in family to family too, maybe, or somewhere it's good to sit next to the person so you're not across from them. So then you're not oppositional. You're with them against whatever it is they're frightened about. Um, when I was really afraid of my son at the beginning, when I really 
needed some help and he needed some help uh, to figure out how we could deal with this. I always kept my phone at the ready. I had my tennis shoes on so I could dash out the door. And um, they always say, don't get caught cornered in a room, you know, keep yourself uh, so you can get out the door. So those are just kind of practical things. But uh, the things that Randy talked about are more what really works long term. Yeah, I would only say just so think about that. Think about it, like your child who you brought in the world and love more than anything in the world. And you have to strategize about keeping yourself safe and also your siblings. I at one point, I mean, his siblings. I at one point, because I have three daughters and two of them are quite a bit younger than Nick. So I had little girls at home. And at one point we had to just simply ban him from the house because not even because so much that he was potentially violent, but it was so disruptive and so unnerving. And I just knew that my daughters had to have the sanctity of their own home. But it was Sophie's choice, you know, and th at the same time, I had to ban my son from my own house. Mm -hmm. Not a happy choice. Yeah. yeah, We had a restraining order against Jim at one time. Um, can I add on to that? I was like wondering how like does it take a mental toll on you when you have to like kick your own child out because you know it's affecting others around you? You know... I I don't know what it cost my soul to do that. I don't even want to really um, contemplate it. But I'm very clear about it, and I don't regret it. You know, it's almost like wartime strategies where you you have to make these decisions and be very clear about them, and I was. And... Um, it's excruciating, but I think when it comes down to protecting the other children, it gets very clear. I think, and even more recently, because <clears throat> my son didn't live with us and then he did, and then he didn't again. And I'm boundaries sound like this. I'm no longer willing to fill in the blank. I'm no longer willing to have him live with us. And I explained to my son, I said, Ben, I love you with all my heart. I also love your sister. And I also love my husband. And I also love myself. And I also love those three little grandchildren. And I'm trying to look out for everybody I love. And this is the this is what I'm willing to do. And but it does break your heart. It does. Yeah. It's really hard. And Jim now has been living with us for the last three years. He's doing wonderfully. So things can turn around. Right, Safa, I think, and I love that you guys are asking follow-up questions. That's good journalism. Okay. Yeah. Right. Marianne's got the thumbs up. If you're yeah. if you're listening and not watching on YouTube, you can see the little dance that's happening here. Uh is this Safa, are you next with the next question? Okay. Yeah. Um, before I ask to add on with karma and what he's been asking. So I know it's different for everyone who does this and but how did it like start for them? Was it like sudden? What did it go like slowly and gradually? Like how did they first start feeling? Um, I, I think for me and Mimi, it was it was I think it was quicker for Mindy, but I'll let Mindy speak. Um, it's different for it's different for everybody, but the classic presentation of schizophrenia for males is around mid-teens, a little older than you guys are. Around the mid-teens, you start acting just a little off. And then the parents think, oh, he's in the wrong crowd or, oh, he's having trouble at school. It's called normalizing. And for about two years, it looks like depression. It looks like bipolar. It looks like moodiness. It looks like just stubbornness. And you try everything under the sun and then things start to get weirder and they want to drop out of school or they they go away with friends for the weekend and spend the whole time sitting in a corner writing poetry and then before you know it you have you're getting phone calls that you know psychic vampires are stealing my energy and 
so it develops gradually. My son started getting a little out of control at 15 or 16. And when I look back now, I can see earlier signs, like at maybe age 14, but it wasn't until age 18 that he got a diagnosis. So it kind of creeps up on you. Was it like, it was like that for you too, Mimi, right? Yeah. You know, I always say if you were to make a list of red flags for serious mental illness and a list of normal teenage behavior, you have the same list. Yeah. You all act crazy. And it goes on for a few years. Oppositional, mercurial, um, um, you know, uh, moody, all these things. And so I would look at him and go, well, he's just like all the other kids. And I think what, what Randy said is right. It's just like there's a point where you just start feeling this little spidey sense on the back of your neck. And you're like, this isn't like all the other kids. But it's gradual at least it was for us, it's gradual and it's um, it's confusing because, like I said, it looks so much like regular teenage behavior. Until it gets so out of hand, you just can't ignore it anymore. Then you're like, okay, this is not normal. Especially when all your friends' kids are starting to get their sanity back. And I, I say that in the very loose sense, like they go like, oh, I think I will study because I'm going to college soon. So they start to come around and your kid's going further into the deep end. And then suddenly you go, oh, wow, this is not. And the thing that Randy said also about at one point, she said, that's called normalizing. That's something you need to know. That's a thing that we all do. And it's a thing that I think that we as mothers especially are so wired to do that because all we want is our kids to be okay and have good lives. And so you start seeing things that are sort of sending up red flags, but you want to normalize it. You're just genetically predisposed to want it to be not this horrible scenario. And so there's so many things I look back on now and I realize, oh man, who was I kidding? But back then, that's what I would do. And uh, as Randy said, for Jim, you know, maybe I'm just stupider than than Randy and Mimi because there oh, were, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are, I mean, I had in hindsight, lots of <laughs> warnings too, but I just attributed it all to drugs. And I thought I did know something about mental illness because my grandmother lived right across the street and she, the radio talked to her and she threw out her food because people were poisoning her and, you know, all that kind of behavior um, I thought was what schizophrenia looked like. And it does, but not at the beginning. And Jim just seemed like a typical teenager who was using drugs. My back of my neck didn't prickle until he was in college and called home one time and said that the women next door were always talking about him because he could hear them talking through the walls. And so that did sound like my grandmother. And so I did have huge pricklings on the back of my neck. But when he came home, he seemed still fine. And he thought he had depression. He went to the doctor and got an antidepressant. And then he was fine for many more months. He wasn't diagnosed till the following summer when um, the antidepressant, because he did not have depression, it was like gasoline on the fire, on the fire and the Zoloft really put him that's when he was punching out walls and that sort of thing, because he that was not the right drug for him. It made him worse. But it, he was 21 when he was diagnosed. So it, I, I didn't see the signs, but they were not looking like mental illness. Even in hindsight, they just look like a drug behavior. And one thing I'll just add, since you're all in high school, I would wish and I don't know if this is true and you're, you're in two, two different high schools, I would wish and hope that guidance counselors and school psychologists in high school are well-versed in the early signs of mental illness and just to be aware of them because I wish, I wouldn't have liked anybody to say, hey, Randy, uh, we're not sure, but this could be an early, here's a pamphlet about schizophrenia. If I had been able to catch it sooner because the the school counselors had entertained that possibility, 
it might have helped open my eyes a little sooner. So, and I even called the school and they were not helpful back then. So that's something that's really improved is what schools do do now. I don't know if they warn people about schizophrenia, but I but they do help the students a lot more. Well, they're very they're very careful about labels. I believe that nobody wants to label a child uh, or a teenager. However, suggesting the possibility could have been. Uh, I'm not I'm not a psychologist, but I you know, and I don't know the educational guidelines, but I would have liked to have heard it. So Safa, was that your question or? Your oh, that was an add on. My um question was that, so, so you all talk about the fact that the laws have to change to better support families going through this. And Mindy, as state lawmaker, you actually did change some laws. So could you talk about your efforts to pass more effective mental health legislations and how in different states across the uh, country? Where, where are they getting it right? Well, the laws I was able to pass were things like better funding for the system. We um, mandated that all teachers had to get training in recognizing mental illnesses so they could refer any students that they saw in their classrooms that looked like they had those symptoms to the school support staff. Um, we passed um, funding for more providers of color because people are more apt to confess or confess, confide in the people that they relate to. Um, a lot of the things we're still working on, we started when I was in the legislature, not just me, but lots of legislators, because I started a mental health caucus that was senators and representatives and Democrats and Republicans. I'm a Democrat. And um, so we did a lot of good and a lot of that has carried on because some of those legislators are still there. Um, the biggest, most controversial bill I passed, but was hard to do, it took a couple of sessions, was earlier intervention. Because right now when someone is sick, if they're not voluntary, which is often the case, they don't think anything's the matter with them or they don't want to take medications or they think everybody else is crazy or something. It's their mother's fault because she's the devil and they need to get away. All of those things. So we passed um, that uh, civil commitment, which is forced care could happen earlier if they had very serious mental illnesses and were doing property damage or they'd been sick before, but they were relapsing and everyone could see where this was going, that there would be a little bit earlier help because as I can't remember if it was Mimi or Randy, but one of them said earlier that early care is so crucial. And if a person doesn't, I think they both said it actually, um, if a person doesn't recognize they're ill, they the fire in their brain cannot be put out. And NAMI teaches that it actually is a fire in the brain. So it's damaging brain cells. And so we wait way too long. And the outcome for responding to medications and long-term outlet is so much better if um, if it happens earlier. But there's a lot of resistance to involuntary care even today. People, There are rights groups that don't, in my opinion, understand um, mental illnesses and what it does to the brain and doesn't allow the person to accept help, kind of like Alzheimer's or something. Um, we need to take care of people if they're really sick and don't know it. And so that was... Um, that was probably the hardest bill that I passed. Everything else that I worked on, we did small things like putting the person's name, person first before it's all the statutes said mentally ill person. And we made it be person with a mental illness throughout all the statutes in the state of Minnesota. So there were lots of things like that. We mandated um, um, postpartum depression education for all parents leaving fathers and mothers leaving the maternity ward. So I could go on. We did a lot of things, but um, yeah. it's amazing. We have a really good mental health system in Minnesota and it's like a C average. Some of the other states, there's good things going on in all states. There's good people, various places. Florida is a terrible mental health system, but they have judge 
um, Stephen Leifman, who's in Miami-Dade, who has an incredible program for diversion and that sort of thing, or catching people early. Um, so any state can have somebody good, but um, Minnesota is one of the best states, and California's been really working to turn around their state lately. New York with Mayor Adams has been trying to help people that are desperately ill living on the streets or in the subways. Um, so there's, you know, something probably good in every state, but I can't think of any one state because Minnesota, one of the best is like a C average. So just so you guys know, we have, we have only like three or four minutes left. So Kayla, I know you have questions, but I want you to pick your favorite question of the questions that you guys had prepared. What is it you would like to ask us? My gosh, you had 14 questions. We're going to have to bring you back for the other seven questions, but these have been fabulous. So Kayla, I'm going to ask you to pick one and okay. What would you like to ask us? I take me a minute so I can look through the thing. Um. Okay. Take, you know, take a minute and, and look at them while, while you're looking at the questions. You know, we, if you're listening, we do have many episodes where we've spoken about national legislation. We, we have the Angry Moms episode is one I would definitely recommend. Uh, Stephanie Marqueso, is that her last name? With Har the Harris Project, talking about in New York and making it nationwide to not have to treat mental illness and substance abuse as two separate things, but rather to treat them as co-occurring disorders. There are a lot of fights to fight and mm -hmm. we are all doing our best to reach our state and, and federal legislators to make the changes. And as Mindy just shared, it's one tiny step at a time. Kayla, you look ready. Yeah, to tie into what you were saying, um, I know many of you are a part of a speaker's network. Mindy, you're active in the policy space. And Mimi, you are working for the mental health organization run by actress Glenn Close. Um, you have all become advocates and activists in this space. So what are some of your primary goals you're seeking to achieve through this work you're doing now? Well, you've done your homework there. Boy, oh boy, these... Uh these reporters are good. Are good. That's half the battle getting knowing what you're who you're talking to and what questions they might be able to answer. I will say two things that I'm working on and I've talked about this before on this podcast and that is trying to get more clubhouse internationals in our state. We're working on having one in our county and we actually almost have it. So I'm really excited about that. The other um, thing that I'm working on um, here in Minnesota is uh, supportive housing because there's just not enough housing. There's not enough affordable housing in general. We we have filled about one tenth of the need we have in our state for affordable housing for people who need it. And then on top of that, we don't have even with what's being built housing that matches people with serious mental illnesses who need, if they don't have families, Jim is here and we are doing a lot of this as parents, but we're old. So we need um, somebody to take over afterwards. And there needs to be staff to help with medication. There needs to be independence and not have staff hovering or even living with you, but just checking in. Um, there needs to be community and socialization, not just in your own apartment. Our son has an apartment, but he's here with us. And um, because he's lonesome over there, he's maybe goes for a day or two here and there. So those are just two things. I'm working on other things too, but we're almost out of time. So maybe yes. Randy and Mimi have something. Well, you know, it's, it, sometimes I feel like I'm that person in the old tale running on the beach trying to save all the lemmings and you can't possibly pick them all up. And my um, philosophy at this point is, well, save this one. And so I kind of operate like that. And my, you know, I'm working hard with the angry moms <clears throat> to change ridiculous laws around certain medications that make it even more difficult you know there's actually a medication that really helps people and yet it's surrounded by these archaic laws and restrictions that make it 
even more difficult to get. And um, so there's that. And, you know, for me, my my main thrust is just to keep talking about it. From day one, I just knew I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be secretive. We got to talk about this. And that, to me, is the most important part. Thank you. And, uh, you know, when my my book is older than Mindy and Mimi's, mine came out in 2011, although the updated version is is out as an audio book. But I like to speak to groups of practitioners with a program of of how to include families in the treatment, in the recovery process. Uh, I call it search, what families need when mental illness strikes. And what do we need? We need support. We need education. We need um, acceptance. We need respect because often we're told it's our fault. We need to learn communication skills. And the practitioners, if they model these communication skills with us, we can bring them home. And we need hope. And sometimes you need a little humor. So <laughs> these are the, these are the things. And in light of that, I also wrote a second book about just, you know, keeping your emotions above water when your kid's falling apart. How do you stay happy? So I wrote a book called Happy and Made Simple. So I speak about mental wellness in general as well. So we each, uh, and then we do this podcast, which is reaching more people all the time. So I have, this has been such a delight. If the world is in the hands of Karma and Safa and Kayla, I think the world is in very good hands as you young women grow up and you've just bowled me over with your, your research and your talent and your seriousness. And I want to thank you for being here. Marianne, any last words you want to say, proud instructor? Well, I knew I knew they were walking into a very friendly environment of, of wonderful professional humanitarian uh, activists, and uh, I think that's a if you're going to start out uh, with your first uh, your first interview on the beat, I think we were we were fortunate enough to be invited. So thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. you for having us. Yeah, thank and you. And also, all. I guess I will plug youthcastmediagroup.org. We are actually looking at other cities. We're working in Philadelphia, Miami. Providence, Washington, D.C. We're moving into the Connecticut area. And uh, so if you uh, know of a school district uh, where kids are eager to learn about journalism as it's going it's under siege, to teach them to talk about these important topics and write about them and, and be advocates for good, um, please reach out to us. Awesome. I, I just want to add in here, my daughter is currently president of the JAWS uh, Journalists of America Women's Symposium, and they are one of their missions, one of her presidential missions is more people of color in the field of journalism. So I yeah. don't know if that's part of your mission or not, but I, uh, and women obviously too, need to support women. There are just so many obstacles for even women being paid what men are in the field. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities, even though there isn't print, uh, there's there's the internet now. And, and the last two jobs Angela's had are not print. They're Politico and now Bloomberg, it's all online. Mm -hmm. So it's so that part is thriving. You're needed in journalism. Well, we'll get but we'll get them there with your help. Thank you. Yeah. And what is the uh, we'll put the website in the show notes, but in case they're listening and don't have the note and they're driving, what is the it's, website to get in touch with you or the email? Youthcastmediagroup.org. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll come back and you know, think about this episode and come back with your follow-up questions. There's some of the best questions are the ones you thought of as you were <laughs> listening because you were still interested and you wanted to ask those questions on the fly. So all of the questions were thoughtful and well-researched and you guys are delightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.